14 this morning. Luke chapter 14. One thing I forgot to mention to y'all a while ago when we were taking up a prayer request. Y'all pray for me and some of the other hell fighters. We're going to be leaving out Wednesday, headed to Fayetteville, Arkansas, to the Bike Blues and Barbecues. Now, I know some of y'all are thinking, man, you're going to have a good time. And we do have fun on these trips. We do. We enjoy the ride. We enjoy each other's company. We go up there and work. We work 10 to 12 hours a day ministering, handing out tracts, whatever we can do. And, and we need prayer while we're up there. We go up there and we face a lot of darkness when we get there. Uh, Y'all be praying for us next Sunday. I, w I know last year I slipped in here right before church on the way back from Arkansas. I made it just in time. That ain't happening this year. We ain't <laughs> leaving until Sunday morning. So there ain't no way I'm going to make it this year. Uh, Brother Richard Burke is going to be here next Sunday. Y'all come. I believe God's given him a good work, a good word, I mean. Uh, Y'all come hear what, what he's got to say. But Luke chapter 14, before we get started, let's do our spiritual breathing this morning. Let's do our little exercise. Any of that junk that you brought in here this morning, any of that stuff that's hindering you, anything that is keeping God from ministering to you this morning, I want you to breathe out and just let it go. Just get rid of it this morning. And look. Don't stop there. If you need to be at that altar before we start this morning, you get to this altar. Don't let anything stop God from ministering to you this morning. As you breathe in, you ask God to fill that place, whatever that was, with His perfect Holy Spirit this morning. Father, I love you and praise you, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity to preach, Lord. Father, I pray at this time you, I can decrease, you can increase, Lord. Father, hide me behind that cross. Father, I pray that your spirit go out before me, preparing the hearts, preparing the minds of each and every individual this morning, Lord. Father, I pray that your spirit just run rampant in this place this morning, Lord. Father, we pray that you bind Satan and loose your spirit on this group of people whom you love. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was studying this message this week, as I was doing some research and I come across the story and it's a story about an old preacher having a revival in his little old country church. So he went around knocking on doors in the neighborhood inviting people to come to this revival they were having. He comes to one house knocks, the little lady comes to the front he tells her about the revival she says I ain't got no peanut butter and he's sitting there perplexed He's like, what are you talking about? You ain't got no peanut butter. He finally asked her, ma'am, I'm not sure I understand. She said, well, I figure one excuse is as good as another. I'd just give you whatever I had this morning. <laughs> Luke. <clears throat> Luke 14. Now, first, let me tell you, I've told you all before, I believe there's only one interpretation of the Bible, and that's a literal interpretation. I believe we can take God's word for what it is. But there's many applications to the Bible. There's many places you can apply these verses into your life. The little interpretation of this section we're going to look at this morning, it was Jesus was sending his disciples out amongst the, the Jews to hear this message that ultimately the Jews rejected and the message went out to the Gentiles because the Jews rejected their own Messiah. The Gentiles got to be brought in to this glorious thing we call the gospel now. And that was the message. The, the application here this morning, and you'll see as you go on, is excuses. We, we've got so many excuses for doing the Lord's work. We find excuses. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. We can find excuses. <clears throat> and we find here this morning, in Luke 14, we find a few excuses we're going to look at this morning. Starts in verse 15. He says, Now when one of these sat at the table with him, heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited me, and went and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. <coughs> Excuse me. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go see it. I ask that you have me excused. Now, the first thing wrong with this is that excuse don't even make sense. Now, I've heard all kinds. Brother Herney, I bet you've heard all kinds of excuses over the years. I have heard excuses after excuses. 
I've had people tell me stuff that didn't make sense. I mean, just wild excuses for this and that. And it's like, I really look that dumb, you know, is what you're thinking sometimes. You really think, you know, do you think, if I don't buy it, do you think God's going to buy that excuse? I had a man tell me that Sunday was his laundry day. That was the only day he could do laundry. He couldn't be in church. I had to do laundry. I said, man, you going to stand before God and say, <coughs> Sunday's my laundry day? And I couldn't do what you called me to do because I was doing laundry? He said, well, when you put it like that, it don't make much sense, does it? <laughs> I said, yeah. And this guy, here's this guy. He says, uh, I bought a piece of land and i got to go look at it. Now, who buys a piece of land before they go look at it? Evidently, he ain't from Florida. People think of Florida, they see beaches. You know, that's what people think of when they see Florida. Us that live in Florida, we think of Florida, we think of swamps, muck, cypress trees. You know, we know what the real Florida, the inside the coastline is like, alligators, all that stuff. You don't buy a piece of land in Florida without looking at it first. You don't buy a piece of land on a hill in Florida without looking at it first. Right down the road from Brother Larry's house, it's, they've been working on that lot for six months now. Looks like it's high and dry, and they've hauled dirt in there and hauled dirt in there, trying to get that thing where they can build on it. Now, this man had went and bought him a piece of ground without looking at it. That don't even make sense. <coughs> That's our excuses sometimes. Our excuses don't even make sense half the time. But the real thing I want you to see in here in verse 18, it's materialistic things. Materialistic things. That's our excuse number one. We cling to materialistic things, and we use them as excuses. We, you know... I gotta mow my grass on Sunday because I want my yard to look good. You're more worried about your house looking good and your yard looking good to your neighbor than you are about yourself looking good to God, being presentable to God. You know, that's the way we are. We get caught up in our materialistic things. Well, you know, I gotta I gotta stay here and be with that because I can't let it go. I, I gotta hold on to that. You know, I got this new car. I, a friend of mine, Richard Burke's gonna be preaching next week. He's told this story. About for years, his wife, every Sunday morning, she'd come out there and she'd say, uh, she'd say, you want to go to church with me this morning? Nope. Nope. And he said he would turn on the radio to Jimmy Swagger, and he'd get out there and start waxing on one of his trucks. That's what he'd do. That was his Sunday morning worship. Truth be known, he's probably worshiping that truck more than he was God. He'd probably tell you that today. That materialistic thing meant more than doing what God's done in called us to do. So many of us are guilty of that. The materialistic things. I'm not just talking about coming to church. Coming to church is important. It really is. I believe folks need to be in church. I believe the church is here to, to help us for that ministry that awaits for us out there. But so many get caught up in the materialistic things, they can't do any of God's work. There's no witnessing involved because all you talk about when you, when you got something materialistic that you're hung up on, that's what you're going to talk about. You can't talk about God and be honest about him when you're hung up on that materialistic. He goes on. <clears throat> in verse... God, forgive me. I got a new Bible. The writing's a lot smaller than my old one. <laughs> <laughs> and another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excuse. Work. Work is another excuse. That's another excuse we use. I don't work... Now listen, we've got people in this church who are in the medical field. And so we've got a lady here and ain't here today because she's out there doing work. And this ain't the people I'm talking to. Medical needs do not wait. I mean, she, people need these. But you got people that was like I was for years. I've got too much going on during the week. My work is more important than anything in my life. I've got to climb that ladder. I've got to be the best. And come the weekend, they're mine. I have worked. I have busted my behind all week. The weekend's mine. I'm not going down there and giving an hour or two to God. I can give it to him right here at the house. We, we put work above what God would have us to do. Our work becomes an idol. You know, we talk about idols. And, and we look back in the Old Testament, and we see the Philistines with their little golden idol, I mean their little wooden idol, and we think, how in the world could they worship a block of wood? Hey, we don't worship much more than a block of wood a lot of times. We let materialistic things, we let our jobs, we let all this stuff become our gods. And it's really no more permanent than a block of wood. No more value than a block of wood in the end. 
But our jobs, our, our work, that, that didn't engulf us so much. Now, we got to work. You know, we, we got to work to eat. The Bible's real clear about a lazy man. Lazy man don't eat, is what the Bible says. <clears throat> We've got to work. But when we let our work become the object of our worship, when we let our work consume us, that's where we start getting in trouble. It becomes more important to us than God. Our work, if nothing else, should be another platform for us to do ministry. Our jobs, that's more people that's coming into our circle, more people we're meeting, more people we get to witness to, we get to share with. More people we get to be a light to. And he goes on. He says, still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Family. Oh, man, family. Family affairs. That can get in the way so many times. You know, there's a lot of school teachers in here this morning. I'm going to tell you, I appreciate Sarah and Ethan over the years have had several school teachers over the years that did not give them homework on Wednesday. Now, they've had a lot of them that do, but they have had them in the past that didn't give them homework on Wednesday. And I appreciate that because that makes it so much easier for parents to get them to church and to get them <clears throat> to be here learning about the Lord, to growing in the Lord. But there's so many things with our families, you know, that my kids can keep me so busy because there's so many things they offer up there. There's so many, you know, there's ball practice, there's band practice, there's all these things, and there's several other parents. We get caught up in all this. And it can distract us. You know, <clears throat> I know there's a many evenings. There's a couple right back here. They grab up their youngins from ball practice, have to rush up here to get here to church on time. And you know, it's it's it would be easy for them to say, you know what? Let's just grab him up, go home, eat supper, and relax. And that's what Satan would like for us to do. He'd like for us to do that. He'd say, you know what? You got all this stuff going on. Your family's busy. You just take the evening off and relax. You know, family affairs will get us, that'll get us wrapped up. And you need to be a part of your family. Do not take me wrong. You need, <clears throat> you need to be a part of your school kids, the things they're interested in. You need to be a part of that and everything. But you can't let it consume you. You can't let your spouse become your God. I know people that their spouse is their God. They worship their spouse. If their spouse says the way it is, it's the way it is, you know. Their spouse says, we're not going to church because I don't feel like it. We're not going, you know. They worship that spouse. Their life is built around that spouse. You can't let your spouse be your God. God should be in the center. God should be in the center of your relationship as a husband and wife. Both of you need to be bound down to him, not one bound down to the other. <coughs> Nobody bound down to Christ. Too many relationships are built like that. Family affairs can get in our way so many times. He goes on. <clears throat> he says, So that servant came and reported these things to the master. And then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. He says, You, you know what? You don't want it? You don't want to sit at my table? I know there's some folks out there that love to have a bite of this. There's some folks out there that would love to come sit at my table. You don't want it? Don't worry about it. I'll go get some people that will. And he goes on and he says, And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded. Still there is room. There's plenty of room at the Lord's table. There's plenty of work to be done in the kingdom. You know, you say, that's another thing. We do a lot. We pass the buck. We say, well, you know, I know there's a lot of work, but He's already got that covered. You know, sister so-and-so, she's got that took care of. Brother Billy Bob, he, he, he took care of that. You know, we pass that off to everybody. We pass it and pass it, and we don't do none of the work. I, I've, I've met people, I've met them in churches. They love to delegate. They love to, they come up with ideas. And this ain't nobody in this church. Don't you remember? I ain't pointing no fingers at none of y'all. I don't believe this is none of y'all. But I, I knew a lady one time. She, she loved to come up with ideas, and she loved to point the finger. And, and, but she never wanted to be there to be a part of it. She would 
I wouldn't even say get the ball in motion. She'd just give the ball a name, more or less, and expect somebody else to put it in motion. <clears throat> and it was like that over and over, and people started catching on to that. And they're like, you know what? You want to do it, you do it. They, they got tired of it. They were doing her work. There's plenty out there for all of us to do. God has a job for every one of us. I've told y'all this time and time again. I don't think anybody's job is more important than the next. I don't. <clears throat> I don't think my job is any more important than the person that cleans the bathroom. I, and I've said this and I've said this. Y'all went a lot longer before I come here without a preacher than y'all did without cleaning those bathrooms. That ought to be proof right there. Everybody's job is important in the kingdom work. I don't care what it is. Everybody's job is important. You know, we think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to just be open and honest with y'all up here this morning. Tanil don't miss very many Sundays. But when she does, the first thought that comes to my mind, what if we have visitors and our piano player in here? You know, what are they going to think? You know, she's that important. You know, she, she's... And she is, man. I, love, I brag on her. I brag on what a good piano player and what a good singer she is. But you know what? God's got this. She don't miss Sundays just to be missing them. She's usually got something that's important for you she misses. God's got this. She's no more important than one of these youngins that are running around here. Yeah, That's her job, and she's willing to do her job. What is your job? And are you willing to do your job? Every one of us, I've told y'all, there is no spiritual gift called pew warming. There is not one. And I'm going to tell y'all this. I have I've been in the church off and on since I was a young. And not once have I been sitting in a pew and had somebody come sit down next to me and say, hey, could you tell me about Jesus? Never had that happen. It has never happened to me. Everybody I've told about Jesus, I've had to go out and share it with them. I've had to go find them. They have never come down and sit here next to me in this church pew and said, hey, share the gospel with me. It just don't happen that way. That's why it's God said, go. He didn't say see it. He said, go in the Great Commission. Go and share the gospel. <coughs> he goes on. He said, and the servant said, Master has done as you command, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highway and hedges. Let's stop right there for a minute. Acts 1 8 says, And you shall receive power. You shall receive power. That means you're not without excuse. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So God's gave you the power. God's gave you the power to get out there and do it through the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the power, it might be because you don't have the Holy Spirit. We might need to be witnessing to you this morning. You're without excuse here. God's gave you the power. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. That's, that's your circle. Jerusalem was the center. It was the core. It was right there. That's your little circle right around you. And then in Judea, you know, he's moving out a little more. So Jerusalem would be like your house. Be your household right there, right there around you. And in Judea, we're talking about Vernon. You know, you're moving on out and you're moving into Vernon. And then he says, in all Judea. So now we're moving on out into the country, all of Florida. We can put the United States in there. Samaria, we're getting on out there to folks we don't even like. We're getting out there in the country up there with the Yankees and all that. We don't even want to be a part of it. We're going out there. And then he says, and in all of the earth, sorry, Larry. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot we had a transplant here. <laughs> and to all of the earth. And that's what we do. We go out all the earth. We, we want to go out in every corner. See, what happens though, we start, we want to do that backwards many times. We want to go out into the furthest reaches of the earth without starting right in our house, right in our home front, right here. That's why I stress so much us being an outwardly focused church and not an inwardly focused. Because our ministry begins right here, right here in this community, right here in Vernon. But before that, it begins right in our households, right in our individual households we got to build. So he says, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. That word compel means to bring about something by the use of pressure. He's kind of saying, twist their arm, twist 
twist their arm a little bit, get them to come in, compel them to come in. Then my house may be full. For I say that none of these men who are invited shall taste my supper. So he's telling us to compel them. He's telling us to go out there so that my house might be full. He's saying, go, get out there. Wherever you got to go, whatever you got to do, get out there and find these people. Don't leave no rocks unturned. Get out there. He's saying, send dresses all over the place to share the gospel. He's saying, go to bike rallies. Go to amongst these heathen in these bike rallies. Share the gospel. Go to truck stops. Go wherever God has called you to go. And don't think to any place it's too good for you because God's got somebody there waiting for the message. He's saying, go, get in there to hear that message of Jesus Christ. Michael gave me this acronym this morning. I've heard him say it before. It's called busy. Y'all probably heard him say it. Being under Satan's yoke. Being under Satan, you know, that's busy. You ever get too busy? You feel like you're too busy? I know what busy is, trust me. And I have to be really careful. I have to be really careful. You can get so busy that Satan will have you right where he wants you. That you can't do nothing for God because you're so bound up. You've got materialistic things. You've got job. You've got family obligations. You've got all this stuff <clears throat> that has you bound up has a yoke upon you, and you can't even pull that yoke. That yoke has you burdened down. Imagine having that around your neck. Having that wrapped around your neck. And the other end tied to a big oak tree. Because that's what your yoke will become like. You'll feel like you can't move it. You'll feel like... You can't do nothing with it. I would put it around my big head, but it might not come off. <laughs> and show you. Um, <clears throat> you'll feel like you can't do anything with it. You'll just be pulling, spinning your feet, just kicking up dirt behind you, not getting anywhere. That's what you'll feel like. But Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He says, I'll take that yoke from you, I'll pull it for you. Come on, let's do this. That's what Jesus is saying. Put down all that other stuff. Quit making excuses. Count on me. See, we've been taught. We've been taught that um, God won't put more on you than you can handle. We've all been taught. We've been taught that our whole lives. That's not completely accurate. God won't put more on you than you can handle with him pulling the load. You try to pull that load yourself, he'll load your wagon until the axles break. You won't be able to get anywhere. But God says, I take that load, I'll take that yoke from you. I'll wear it for you. And you will be able to do anything I have called you to do. <clears throat> if you're here this morning, if Tennille comes up, play something, please. If you're here this morning, you're heavy laden, you're, you're burdened. If you just, if you're guilty like I have been so many times, making excuses, and we look at excuses. I, I'll share with y'all this real quick. I had no intentions of going with Wednesday. I had no intentions of going on this Arkansas trip. I really didn't. I done said I'm not going this year. I went last year. Had a great time. Seen some real productive ministry work out there but I had you know I don't want to use the vacation time I don't want to do this I don't want to do that we're riding 700 and something miles in one day it's going to be a rough ride I was making excuses and God said keep going I want you to go what do you do then I can either say nope I ain't doing it God and be like Peter and deny him. Or I can go. Have you been making excuses for what God's called you to do? If you have, come down here and talk with him this morning. If you need to just come to these altars and say, Lord, I love you. Come down to these altars.